Hey, good evening from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. My name is Pascal Alente, Director of the United Nations University International Institute for Global Health, or UNUIGH, which is the UN designated think tank on global health, hosted by the Government of Malaysia and co located with the National University of Malaysia, UKM. On behalf of my co-chairs, Asi El Haji and Sarah Hawkes, my fellow commissioners on the Lancet Commission on Gender and Global Health, Jocelyn Clark, our commissioning editor from the Lancet, who works very hard to keep us on track, and the UNU IIGH Gender and Health Hub, I am delighted to welcome you to this event in conversation with Commissioner Jessica Horn. Um, can I, um, and can you just let me know if I am visible? I'm not, it's not clear that my camera is working. And can I get a steer, please? Is, is everything okay? Yes, you are visible and audible, Pascal. Great, thank you. Um, so the usual um, housekeeping, uh, tell us who you are and where you're joining us from. Share your questions and thoughts through the Q&A function. Take advantage of the opportunity to e-meet new people, exchange ideas, and have a dialogue with the amazing women we have in conversation with us this evening. Um, please remember to um, tweet um, with the given hashtags um, that we have. Um, and um, uh, uh, we, we please join the conversation through Twitter, YouTube, Zoom, all of which provide the opportunity for you to engage and the flexibility to participate, recognizing the challenges that some of you may have with platforms and your bandwidth, um, one of which is clearly my problem at the moment. Now, before I cede the microphone, a few words about tonight's conversation. Um, there have been several discussions about the impact of the COVID pandemic um, the lens it has shone on inequities and the catalytic, catalytic opportunity it presents for real change. But the nature of that change is politically charged with significant risk of further exacerbating injustice in the interest of particular types of responses to the pandemic. Major funding is being pulled out of development programs in poverty reduction, education, health, social welfare, and justice and rights protection. And more than ever before, funding is skewed to technological fixes. And while there are promises to make technologies available to low and middle income countries, um, there's a significant reluctance to transfer technology or to share it or to recognize knowledge and scholarship that is driven from less powerful spaces of influence. Unfortunately, financial resources remain a powerful driver and hamper our efforts to flip this narrative. And that is why I'm delighted to introduce the stars of this evening's conversation. So we have, um, as I mentioned, Jessica Horn. Um, and in addition to being a commissioner, Jessica is a feminist analyst and technical advisor on women's rights with 20 years of experience in civil society, donor and multilateral spaces in the African region and globally. She has served as director of programs for the African Women's Development Fund, a senior advisor to AIR at the Stephen Lewis Foundation and coordinator of Amanitari, the African Partnership for Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights. In thought leadership, in, in a thought leadership role, uh, Jessica pioneered the African Women Development Fund's Future, Futures Initiative, forecasting the future of women's rights in Africa, and led the creation of AIR, a practice-based initiative to reconceptualize approaches to trauma and mental health and well-being from an African feminist perspective. She is a founding member of the African Feminist Forum Working Group and chairs the program committee of the Fund for Global Human Rights. Latanya Mapfrep is president and CEO of the Global Fund for Women, one of the world's leading foundations for gender justice. She has received many honors and awards, including two esteemed meritorious honor awards from the US government and the highest honor in civil service, the Superior Honor Award from the US State Department. 
Under her leadership, the Global Fund for Women has fueled feminist movements across the world, putting resources directly in the hands of courageous activists who are working to end oppressive policies and change entrenched norms. As a feminist fund, the Global Fund for Women offers flexible support to diverse groups of partners. More than 5,000 groups across 175 countries so far to create meaningful change that will last beyond our lifetimes. And talking about our lifetimes, we have a young and brilliant um, researcher with our team at UNUIIGH, Tiffany Nasser Ansari. Tiffany majored in global and gender studies and is passionate about social justice, minority rights, and equitable reforms of systems of oppression. We are privileged to have her supporting the work of the commission and other convening activities at UNUIIGH. So without further ado, I will hand over now to Tiffany, who will provide a brief presentation to set the ball rolling and then take over the panel discussion. Tiffany, over to you. Thank you, Pascal, for that very kind introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Safina Suryan Sari. Thank you for joining us. And I'm very, very excited to present Radically Sensible Feminist Philanthropy in Global Health. Now, this is a vast topic that we couldn't possibly do justice to within just one hour. But we do hope that what this webinar will do is channel new voices and new energy towards this collective shift in global health funding. What I'd like to start with now is just to take five minutes of your time and do some scene setting before we get into the main discussion session. And if we could have, thank you. Uh, Pascal touched briefly on the commission and you can find more information on our website, which Radical will be dropping a link to into the chat box. Thank you. I won't take up precious time today with an origin story of the commission, but I would like to emphasize that the commission is committed to working in inclusive and disruptive ways. And the secretariat seeks to fulfill this mandate in our public engagement programs as well. To that end, we kept these principles in mind while developing our approach to engagement and chose to take a decolonial feminist approach based on our research, our goals and our values. I'm highlighting on this slide here two quotes that most accurately sum up our thinking and strongly guide our approach. And I would like to take a moment to thank Pascal as well as my supervisor and our project manager, Emma, for providing really strong thought leadership and shaping this approach here. Decolonial feminism to us means two things, with history serving as the bridge between them. Firstly, it means acknowledging that our ideas of gender, health, and gender and health are undeniably colonial, both in their historical origins and in their contemporary operationalizations. And secondly, it represents to us an effort to restore balance to these spaces by seeking out the voices, stories, and successes that continue to be marginalized by the mechanisms of coloniality. The Change Makers workshop series represents our attempt to pilot this approach and do our part in rebalancing the scales. Our decolonial feminist approach compelled us to seek out the voices that are absolutely crucial to this conversation and yet continue to be sidelined. Through this workshop, we hope to accord them the recognition that they deserve as we seek to learn with and from our partners in this journey of understanding past successes and envisioning future agendas. The goal for us is to co-create meaningful outcomes through equal partnerships. And as part of this process, we engaged in several conversations with our partners prior to the workshops to better understand their needs and expectations. What quickly became clear to us, however, was that despite the diversity of our partners in terms of how well established their organizations are, how much experience they've had with seeking funding, and how they capture and present their successes, everyone was struggling in one way or another to secure strategic support that would enable their work to continue in the long term. This reflects a wider contradiction within the space of grassroots activism. There is increasingly an acknowledgement that imposing so-called universal solutions that originate in the global north, for lack of a better term, is not the answer, and that community and grassroots work is in fact the most effective road to take as it is those positioned within the community who best understand the challenges faced by their peers and hence how best to go about making changes. Now, this is a theme we hear again and again, and yet grassroots and community work, the two most important pathways to change, remain overlooked and underfunded in the grand scheme of things. 
So we dug deeper to try and understand why this is happening. And in a full circle moment, we found ourselves returning to these ideas of decolonial feminism. Current funding mechanisms, much like many other global structures we work with, continue to operate based on outdated and colonial ideas of what counts as good evidence of whose expertise has value and where to look for success stories. The limits of our current funding climate are clearly illustrated. The solutions, however, are not so easily found. So in this session, we are exploring feminist philanthropy as a new model of funding to fill that gap. I will leave the task of defining feminist philanthropy to our experts, but for our particular purposes, we see feminist philanthropy as a natural extension of feminist standpoint epistemology, which teaches us that every person has valuable knowledge because, and not despite of, the fact that their knowledge is uniquely situated to their own contexts and communities. If we accept that these unique and particular knowledges have value, then the natural next step is to treat them as such, and in so doing, to challenge and expand ideas of fundability. That is where I will stop off for now, because I really am quite excited to get into the discussion portion of today and hear from our two incredible speakers, who are the rare few to actually walk the talk in this space. We have with us today our Commissioner Jessica Horn in conversation with Latanya Mupfred, CEO and President of Global Fund for Women. Our discussion will begin with some initial thoughts on what feminist philanthropy means to them, a closer look at what the challenges are and how feminist philanthropy offers us a way forward. We will be wrapping up with a Q&A session, so please do share your questions and comments throughout the webinar so that we can pick up on them later on. Jessica and Latanya, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And I would like to start by picking your brains to better understand feminist philanthropy. Uh, Latanya, since I did pick from your website to hint at the global <laughs> fund space, I'd like to start by asking you, what does feminist philanthropy mean to you personally? And how does that resonate with the work of Global Fund for Women? Absolutely. And thank you, Tiffany and Pascali and all of the uh, partners for this conversation. Um, I, we need to have it as much as possible. I feel like we're at a time when this window is so important for all of us. Um, and so when I think about feminist philanthropy and when I came to Global Fund for Women a few years ago, um, I, I like to keep it simple. I know what women do with money. I watch my grandmothers work day in and out to support not just their family, but the families up and down our block in Philadelphia. I saw them and their church friends save money in a jar for emergencies, like when someone gets arrested or a child is sick and needs to go to a hospital and we didn't have insurance back then, or even better to send someone's grandkid to college. You know, the investment of 20 or $30 from everybody in the neighborhood, in the community, to the lady next door who wants to start a business. This is what women do with money. And so when we talk about gender justice movements and the huge social returns in, in for that presentation, Tiffany, I just nod. I'm like, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the real tragedy, though, is that we are still convincing people that this is the right thing to do to support social justice movements, um, to support women in their communities who are trying to do that. It's, it's embarrassing to that these amazing women doing incredible things receive such a tiny investment. Less than 1% of gender equality funding reaches the grassroots. And, 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 you know, and so feminist funding means shifting that power to historically marginalized communities, including women, girls, gender non-conforming people. It means getting flexible funding and resources directly to feminist activists who know exactly how to use it. And in a Global Fund for Women, we, we've been doing this for, for 30 years as a kind of a conduit for funders, whether they're governments, foundations, multilaterals, um, but the, the you know, the agenda really is to scale localization in the quest for, for gender equality. And, and I feel like we've met the challenge through just a myriad of global disasters. We will not stop until gender equality is realized. So if it's COVID, if it's climate justice, we're just going to keep moving. And in fact, I think during times of crisis, we need to support uh, these, these women even more because they're the most affected and they're the working on the front lines. And we talk a lot about what the 
impact has been. But quite frankly, you know, who, the solutions are coming from these women and girls and, 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 and um, you know, responding to their community's immediate needs is what they do every day, especially in crisis. So we have to reimagine and recreate a better world for the long term where they feel supported and centered and that we're able to get resources to them really quickly so they can continue to do this work. I'll stop there, Tiffany, but thank you. Thank you so much, Latanya. And it's really, really, it, it means so much to see that progression of how personal it is to you of living through that experience. And now you're the one bringing that model to the world and um, bringing it to a larger scale. And it's just so inspiring and important in this time. Jessica, um, coming from a very unique background where you have that activist experience and also experiences in this spaces, uh, what are your thoughts not only on feminist philanthropy, but on the rise of feminist philanthropy as a potential complement to feminist activism? Yeah, no, thank you, Tiffany. And again, it's just such a pleasure to be in a space with such amazing people, Latanya, Tiffany, Pascal. Really, I think... Um, when we look at how the world is shifting and how leadership in the world is shifting, it also gives us a sense of possibility, which is great. Um, and Latanya, I love your explanation because it's true that sometimes we can get esoteric about the idea of it, but in reality, it's a model that's existed in community for a very long time. And what formalized philanthropy is doing is in some respects trying to learn from or echo and take that to scale. Um, and so it's interesting to, to think in, in feminist philanthropy is rising now and, the, and in expanding. Historically, women's funds were the core of this movement. Um, the first women's funds created were Global Ones, Mama Cash and Global Fund for Women um, that addressed, I mean, um, work that was happening in the majority world, Global South. Um, and, um, but, you know, quite quickly after that, actually funds um, were then developed regionally, African Women's Development Fund, Urgent Action Fund Africa, funds in Asia, funds in Latin America, thematic funds on different issues that kind of really took to their heart this idea that feminist vision and feminist transformation has always been for the benefit of everybody. But the key factor that makes it different is that it centers the leadership of women, gender non-conforming people, and also people facing additional marginalizations in how it does so. And I think that has been the marked difference with a lot of other funding, right? Um, and so, and this has been a model that actually resourced for, for decades, the grassroots. Um, if you look at the AWID research, um, AWID in 2005 put out this groundbreaking report called Where the, Where's the Money for Women's Rights that actually helped create a, an evidence base for understanding the patterns of funding globally around women's rights and actually really the deficit in funding. But one of the things that it showed was that women's funds, even if they gave small amounts, were actually the most present funder across organizing, right, across the world. So women, the women's funds model is actually central and the women's funds model has always been about working out ways to leverage community resources as well as match funding from larger donors, centralizing the leadership of the people most affected by the concerns, thinking about the work we do through a power-based lens, um, but then also looking at ways to support flexibility. So allowing people to organize in the ways that they want to um, and looking at as flexible as possible, even with small amounts of money. Um, and so I think that that is sort of one of the, it's, a, it's an approach that's actually really underlying and informing so much of the push um, that we have now around this broader call in philanthropy for general operating support for funding and work that is led by and for, right? Um, it's really kind of rooted there. The new layers are interesting to see large foundations really get on board in a major way has been important because actually not all of the work on gender equality works at a small scale or at a local scale. There actually is a need to be able to resource national, transnational and global work and to do so actually requires um, adequate resources and there had really been a gap there and so it's really vital to be able to see resources at larger scale going into that that also the 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 limitation on resources had meant that a lot of organizations weren't growing and there also wasn't a, an ability to invest in some of the core things around being able to to create really resilient organizations in the long term I think the new actors on the block are um, are the high net worth individuals who are giving. And of course, we know uh, Melinda Gates, Mackenzie Scott, 
Um, there's actually quite a bit of giving that's also happening in the global south led by women as well, high net worth women. And I think that's a really interesting space to watch. I think it does pay attention to, again, the precedent that had been set before. In some respects, I actually think Mackenzie Scott's model is similar to a women's fund model. It's just that she does it by surprise, you know, um, you know like she, she makes a surprise announcement. But in actuality, the whole idea of trust based, of, you know, of giving um, giving in a flexible way, uh, supporting the leadership um, of organizations, really doing work that's very deeply connected to the ground and to frontline, et cetera, is kind of actually to the core of that model. So I see a continuity and I think it's exciting. I just think that we need to be more respected. Um, I think we need to be more respected and more acknowledged in the field. Um, and for the innovation to be properly accounted for, because I think that it is it, there is innovation. And there's also, as I said, decades of experience and expertise around even sort of like the technical aspects of how you do it well, which I think um, could probably do with more engagement, um, actually, in the mainstream philanthropy sector. Thank you both. And I'm going to flag right here, right now, that for anyone wanting to learn more on feminist philanthropy, this year was a crash course. So thank you for just that all encompassing um, introduction right there. We're going to move now into trying to understand not so much the benefits of feminist uh, philanthropy. It is radically sensible. I think it does not need explaining, as we've just heard. But I want to take a step back and, and try to see we've identified here the challenges of the fact that it's not being scaled up, it's not being respected. And why do we think that's happening? What are the, the challenges and the shortcomings within this current model? And why is it so resistant to change and to accepting feminist philanthropy as a way forward, actually? And Latanya, if you would like to start. Sorry, Latanya, you're still muted. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know I was controlling it. Um, I apologize for that. Um, and I, I was just saying that I love uh, Jessica mentioning the really just even the word respect, I think is um, is, is fundamental in the systems and the structures um, of philanthropy, of international development, you know, of the sort of work that we've been doing over the years um, to ensure that so many of the issues that are important for women, um, but generally um, are lifted up and, and, and further resourced. And so, you know, for for me, when I, I think about that word respect, when I think, you know, not just about it from the head, but from the heart, you know, I think about a structure that um, for the 30 years I've been in this business, where funders tend to want to really, you know, sort of single out issues. Um, where we have been, um, you know, responsible really for funding in silos. And I think that is a, is, is, is a form of disrespect, particularly when you talk about women's and women's lives. Um, so like only funding reproductive rights or only funding education programs really does miss the point. And that is that the approach I think that uh, women's funds are trying to move away from. And I think we're doing a good job of really talking about that in a way that gets people to kind of wake up and look. I know Kimberly Crenshaw um, talked about the intersectional lens um, in the work that she was doing around uh, race and gender and thinking about the challenges that women faced and bringing these issues forward. Um, you know, so, I mean, women are dealing with these things from all, you know, you know, coming at them in all ways. And it's such a disservice to the communities we serve and support if we don't address these as very real life lived experiences and think about ways to bring them together. We have to recognize that, you know, the that women are not just a monolith and, and and they experience multiple and overlapping sources of oppression all the time. The struggle for women's rights is deeply impacted by and, and, and connected to the struggles for racial justice, queer justice, um, immigration justice, climate justice, and, and I could go on, but I think you get the point. And at Global Fund for Women, we just believe deeply that this intersectional approach to systemic and social change. Um, we know that if we if we 
if we work in this way and allow women to determine sort of what's the priority um, and respect those choices and trust those choices, we'll get closer to the world that we really want to see where every woman, girl and trans person and, and others is, is strong, safe, powerful and heard. And globally, um, and I think uh, uh, Jessica was mentioning this, that, you know, we, we have to work to ensure that we are bringing as many voices as possible into the conversation about gender justice. And so whether that's, you know, sort of at the very, very local level or all the way up to the global justice, um, you know, I'm sorry, to the global level, we know that our partners are working to ensure that this intersectional lens is applied to their work. And we trust that. And they're demanding that gender justice movements reflect um, an anti-patriarchal, anti-racial, and decolonial principles altogether. And so when we see and, and trust that women can attack these issues, not in silos, but as a, you know, a much more coordinated and intersectional approach, I think we'll start to see kind of respect come to life. And I think that um, if we can uh, think about sort of if you know like women's funds are very close to grassroots, um, and then there's the larger philanthropy and larger NGOs that do more of the work of scale. Um, I think if we leverage each other's um, resources, if we leverage that work and take the onus off of um, organizations in in um, in the grassroots and communities and countries to have to find out, you know, where they can find resources and money to do their work. And instead we flip that. And that's what we talk about with shifting power. We flip that and we go find them. So they're there when they need us to be able to fund um, particular circumstances, particular events in their communities, and certainly these intersectional inequalities that they're facing. And, and I think that's how we get to dismantling um, this industrial complex of aid. That's how we start to see leadership um, build in communities and into national players to be able to really make these long lasting changes that we, we see. And this is what we're committed to at Global Fund for Women, looking at that whole chain and respect and partnership throughout so that we can see um, the actual solutions happening uh, in front of our faces. Thanks. Thank you, Latanya. So important what you've just said about being there for them rather than them having to seek out the resources because these grassroots activists are so overtaxed and overstretched. And the last thing they need is to learn the rules of this completely arbitrary game and figure out how to play it. Um, so Jessica, sort of along those lines, that same question for you, what are the inherent flaws and shortcomings within this model, these rules of the game and, and how why are they so resistant to change and what can we do about that? Um, okay. On a level, I have some empathy um, for certain categories of grant makers because they're in a position um, where they're sort of between a rock and a hard place sometimes and what they're able to do. So, for example, with bilateral funding, um, there is tremendous pressure because it's taxpayer money. And um, if countries that are giving aid are um, facing uh, an electorate that has questions about... Um, you know, the, the ODA commitments, um, it does place additional pressure and additional scrutiny. And so very often for them, the way that they feel they can best control that is to then be controlling in the way that they finance. So for example, to give um, quite narrow project funding, um, to be able to give, you know, sort of very tightly um, designed and tightly accounted for, um, you know, uh, uh, funding arrangements. Um, for the African region, that's a lot of how the civil society sector is funded. And so that really does affect. I think what's important, though, is for everybody. And so I think um, private philanthropy actually has more leeway. And I actually think because of that, it's very important um, that philanthropy plays a role in trying to think about how to loosen up that dynamic a little bit. Because organizations need breathing space. They need space to think. There's no way that you can actually... Um, do constant innovation and really come up with effective solutions to complex problems if you have no paid time to think. Like the thinking time has to be built into the model of work. Otherwise, how can you do it? I think if you look at the corporate sector and you look at high it, 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 in, uh, in the business environment where there's high innovation, like in technology, you'll see that a lot of technology companies have inbuilt time for people to think 
right, to generate ideas, to network, to experience the world, to think about things so that they can come back and innovate with what they're doing. We deal with even more complex problems because we're dealing with the reality of people's lives and the complexities there. The stakes are higher than a product, right? The stakes are literally whether people live or die sometimes. Um, and so because of that, it's actually crucial that we build in thinking time. To do so, we actually have to fund core, right? We have to fund the indirect costs. We have to fund time that is not literally allocated to project, right? Because otherwise there's no space for that. We also have to resource adequate um, staffing in general. And again, nothing can run without good finance, good admins, support, etc. And in a way, a lot of the ways that things are financed act as if all of those things that are considered indirect aren't directly affecting the ability to actually do the work. And of course they do. So I think it's crucial that we, you know, really look at that and think about what are ways the call for core and flexible funding is precisely for these types of uses. The pieces of organizations that enable them to be resilient and enable them to have impact is what is funded when you fund core. And it includes their ability to do their programming, but in essence, to do it better. So I think that those are some of the things. And I, then the last thing is just the duration. So again, it's really difficult to solve for complex long-term problems with short-term money. It seems like a simple uh, argument, um, but it's so interesting how resistant um, we all are to rethinking the timeframes within which we work. Um, funding over a slightly longer term than you know, two years even um, enables organizations to again be able to get that arc right? Complex social change, which is also underlying really as a kind of root drive of being able to solve for a lot of health problems that we're talking about, particularly in the domain of gender and health, requires an investment over time to shift, but also retain change, right? We've seen, fine, with the evidence-based prevention work that you can achieve gender norm change and the norms underlying, you know, intimate partner violence, for example, in a project time frame of say five years, but that doesn't account then for backlash. So you've managed to shift, but then what happens then if that in response to that shift, there's backlash in the community or backlash in the society, and you end up with people trying to reinforce normative behavior, pa normative patriarchal behavior, right? You need to fund that work over the long term to make sure that it sustains, that it sticks, that it grows, that it in actually becomes rooted in the ways that people really think and do over time. So I feel like those are some of the elements. And again, I understand, I have empathy with the tension that pieces of the donor community face. But like I said, I do think that there's room there for even, for even in, within those spaces to push back a bit and just really think for themselves about is there more flexibility than they're giving themselves to rethink this. But also in places where there is greater flexibility, it's almost a responsibility actually to lean into that and to think about how can we help um, do what we know is needed, what the organizations and, 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 and movement spaces that we fund say is, is essential, what the evidence show is critical. How can we do that and actually lean into that and do it and do it well and kind of free up again um, some of the pieces that are essential uh, for success? I just, if I can just you, say, um, I, you know, plus one for, for that. Um, and, you know, what Jessica is saying, and, I, you know, I, I worked for a long time with USAID. And so we kind of understand, you know, in, in the bilaterals, you know, we pay, um, uh, you know, larger NGOs and or for profits to, to do this kind of work um, that we're talking about. Um, but when it somehow, you know, when it comes to thinking about um, in, you know, uh, a, a, or a local organization, um, a community-based structure, somehow we don't translate that into they certainly need long-term, um, they probably need even more um, support for their capacity than let's say a, um, a for-profit um, organization. 
uh, instead of the other way around, we saw with Amplified Change how it, you know, so the for-profit got more than the, the women's funds who have to build the capacity of the organizations that they're funding and who have to do that because of our values. We can't just say to them, you get this one grant and then we'll figure it out later. We, we have to say to them that we're in this for the long haul, whether that's two years or 10 years, we're going to be here to support you. Um, and, and that's how we literally raise money with the interest of those groups in mind. And, and the unrestricted and core piece, it just cannot be, un, you know, overstated, should I say, that work, um, you know, is what builds the leadership. And we talk about the stories of Lima Gaboi and Malala and, and so many more, but it is that ability for them to be able to get core funding to build an institution around their championship and not just have one person burned out and then will, to never see them again. Um, we really have to invest in this work. Um, because it is the only thing, as both of you have talked about, that is going to mean long-lasting social change. Thank you both. And already we see some actionable recommendations. Uh, we need to bring the resources to the people who need them rather than create extra work for them. We need to support core work. We need to really, especially in this climate of democratic backsliding, remember that progress is not a one-way street. Um, and of course, Global Fund for Women leading by example here. Um, this is all stuff that we're seeing on the funder side. I want to flip the script a bit now and talk about the work that these grassroots activists are doing. And the fact that despite you know all the odds and all the challenges, they really are finding success. Uh, is the onus then on the funders to find a way to work with these groups to really uh, capture those successes and turn that into knowledge and and um, sorry and um, success into knowledge into publications into capturing them in whatever way that's necessary to then mainstream these ideas as evidence that this is the shift we need that this is possible and it's already happening on the ground and really what it just needs to do is to be scaled up with everyone's support and buy-in and really whoever wants to jump in at this point. <laughs> Um, I'm happy to get started, and I, you know, and, and really interested to to hear what um, what Jessica you're seeing from your your vantage point. Uh, I, you know, I, I mentioned earlier this imperative that we have to look at at social change not just as um, uh, organizations with solutions um, finding us, the funders or the um, the academics that you know the academics and uh, you know, to be able to, or the tech, you know, uh, organizations, um, we really need to struggle and to work hard to be able to find them. We do live in a world right now where it is not that difficult. I was just at MIT Solve and, you know, and the thing that I said there was that if I can go online and look for a pair of black sandals and every time I check my email or every time I go on Google, those, you know, there's a new version of a black sandal that comes up. It's got to be possible for us to know what's happening around the world with gender justice movements and where there are sparks where there are emerging movements happening to be able to engage them um, in the work that they're doing and, and ask what the support is. Because I don't think the problem is the solutions. The solutions are there. Um, even when it comes to, you know, women's health, you know, um, or health care for women. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the solutions are out there. They're, um, they're local. They're, um, uh, you know, brilliant and exciting, um, but it is how do we find them and how do we then support them? And, and, and if we're going to provide, you know, holistic change through philanthropy, we have to look at these, um, you know, not just the, the very specific uh, nuance of a strategy that was created, let's say in San Francisco, um, but we have to look at all the social determinants that um, keep particularly a woman in a cycle of, you know, like poverty, abuse, or illiteracy. So really thinking about the most intersectional way to really look for solutions and then to scale them. And I don't mean scale in the sense of take one solution that worked in New York City and then ask, you know, everyone in Africa to, to take that solution on. But I really do mean scale in the sense of 
of what you were mentioning, Tiffany, is to talk about it, you know, to, to have the voice of the leadership that created these solutions um, talk to others around the world. Um, we know that funding and supporting uh, gender justice advocates and, and developing strategic partnerships is going to be crucial. Um, Jessica brought up Mackenzie Scott and how what we call resource partners or, or what have been typically called donors um, really have a great place um, to play in this. These individual donors um, uh, we have been experiencing through a Global Fund for Women, a program called Champions, right? So Champions for Equality. It is asking uh, resource partners to join activists, to be able to partner together um, and to look at uh, not just support to their movements around the world, but some of us come out of that, the expertise, and lift that up to, for the rest of the world, for all of us to learn together. So we apply sort of newfound knowledge and explore these shifting um, power dynamics to make sure that we benefit the most impacted by issues. We're doing this right now. We're doing it with climate justice. Um, and we we know that climate justice is the issue um, in, in this crisis that's really gonna be at the forefront of the intersection. We've decided to work specifically with small island states because that, you know, in islands, they've been grappling with the effects of climate change in ways that um, we've only begun to acknowledge. And so, you know, for me, when I think about the question, Tiffany, it really is, uh, you know, not just what are the solutions, but being able to partner with women, with communities as they really try to um, figure out new ways of living um, in what we would have thought years ago as unimaginable circumstances. Uh, so I'll stop there, but I do think it's just so important for us to, to really come back to um, how do we show up? as um, funders, as supporters, um, as researchers, advocates, um, to be able to support the solutions that are already coming up out of necessity. And how do we lift those up so those voices are heard? Because I think that's the thing that's going to have the results in health conditions, whether that's physical, mental, environmental, that we're all looking for. Thanks. Thanks, Latanya. And I'm conscious of time and we do want to get to Q&A session in this webinar about voices and making sure that voices beyond our tree are heard. But Jessica, could you jump in for a bit and share with us some of your thoughts on this? Sure. So, I mean, one thing I think is important to consider, too, is that in, um, say, for example, African context, there are a range of actors working um, on feminist transformation. Um, and so you do have smaller, um, what we call grassroots organizations, but you also have, um, you know, larger um, and differently positioned organizations who are working with a mind to sort of international policy or national policy, et cetera. You have academics, et cetera. And I think the whole ecosystem of that is actually generally starved. And so what we see in knowledge, so knowledge production, if that's um, one of the pieces of this conversation, knowledge production is also um, faces a similar kind of dilemma. African feminist knowledge production is, un is unresourced, <laughs> you know, more or less. Um, and I know that, um, that, um, that your institution um, and also some of the work that's coming into the Lancet Commission is also showing, again, if we're looking at decolonizing knowledge production, we need to look first at even publication and who has access to publication um, in terms of who's writing about and who's getting known for understanding and analyzing the, works, the work that's going on. Um, but then also even access to that knowledge, that so much of that knowledge is behind paywalls. Um, Professor Sylvia Tamale, who's just retired from Makere Law School, but she's one of the most significant um, sort of Pan-Africanist feminist academics um, uh, in Uganda and regionally, um, has written quite interesting analysis about this, you know, about really like the serious, you know, uh, inequalities in publishing. Um, and 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 also the need then to actually think about models that 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 um, address that. That is how you decolonize knowledge production. So I think it's important to firstly recognize that there is all sorts of knowledge production happening and all sorts of potentials there. In feminist funding spaces, we always talk about the need for documentation. I think what we need to do is just look even at that to look at how we can increase its rigor, um, because I do think that um, to create 
to create knowledge that is useful to be shared, we actually still need some work, to be honest. But I think that, again, if we fund into that, it's not funded. If we fund into that, it would actually help create really fascinating fascinating um, evidence base that could be more widely used. One of the most interesting kind of recent experiments with this has been in the field of evidence-based prevention of violence against women and just lifting up that actually the pioneering models around evidence-based prevention were actually um, rooted in African um, organizing, right, in African models for doing this work. Um, and I think those of that whole sort of experience um, has been interesting because it's also shown up what happens when there is an asymmetric understanding about whose voice matters, whose knowledge matters, who's expert and who isn't. So I think we need to deal with this broader agenda of power dynamics in, in the knowledge production space as well, and think about, again, who's, who, is, um, who are lead authors, who's actually supported to you know, engage, what format that's produced in so that it's accessible to the you know, whole community of people and not just only a very tight group of researchers. The um, people always talk about needing to really unsettle this idea of randomized control trials as a gold standard of evidence, because what we're also finding is that in order for something to be considered evidence, it has to go through such a process that is so restricted and so expensive, right, um, that it means that very little ends up passing um, passing through. And so very little ends up being part of the global repository of what we consider to be evidence about understanding about what works, um, you know, what helps to make change. So I feel like there's, there's, there's so many layers um, for this work, but I think it has to begin with acknowledging that there is knowledge, right? There is expertise in the context that we're talking about. And that um, there is no way that you can do effective activism without understanding it, right? So, I mean, even that in itself is an odd kind of idea of sort of, I don't know, like naive activism, that like people just go and do things and suddenly change happens. It is intentional. It is systematic. People sit down and think about what they're doing. They sit down and think about how they're going to organize and mobilize. They reflect on strategies and whether or not they're working, right? When they have wins, they think about where else they can go. They think about strategic alliances and how to maneuver and how to do. That includes the church ladies, right? <laughs> right? It, that, that is, that, that, that's thought, right? There is thought behind all of that, okay? There's analysis behind all of that. So I feel like at, at, the, at the very base of it is just really being able to appreciate and understand and acknowledge that there is knowledge there, right? Um, and then build from there to think about and then, okay, so we recognize it. And then how can we then work with it? How can we, you know, better help support documentation of it, analysis of it, comparative conversations, access to it in other spaces, and then thinking about taking it to scale in terms of using it to inform our broader ways of thinking about how change happens and what to do. Thanks, Jessica. And definitely in, in our work, when we're thinking about knowledge, there's always this hierarchy of institutional knowledge and experiential knowledge. And, you know, those of us sitting in an office writing about activism and teaching activists what to do really makes no sense. Absolutely. Um, Latanya, right before we get into the Q&A session, any thoughts from you? No, I mean, I totally agree with everything that was said and I, you know, in, in, in the way that it was said. So I, I think we should just jump into the Q&A and hear what people um, are thinking about. Great. So we have a question here. As a local small scale NGO catering to a small population, what would be our responsibilities to show the commitment that would get us the attention of the global funders? In short, what are the responsibilities at the recipient's end? And Jessica, would you like to go first? Um, I mean, I think, you know, you, you do your work in response to what is a priority, um, you know, for the people that you're looking to serve and to work with to help transform their lives. Um, and it's very important to stay with that mission. Um, and I think that the best form of fundraising, which in some respects seems like this is a question, is really trying to match that to what um, resources are available elsewhere, rather than shifting um, to define what you need to do by what others say is important. 
So I think that piece is really critical. So doing your research should just work out who shares the same passions, who shares the same analysis, or who shares the same concerns for particular constituencies or particular areas of the world, and working out if there's a good match there. That's one of the best ways to help prevent mission drift as well. So you don't start going off course because you're following, again, what donors are prioritizing is important. So I would say that that's really, really critical. And then in general, most funders really just look for um, you know, an analysis of what the problem is and a promising sense of, you know, of, of solution. So just, you know, a sense that the organization or the group clearly has a sense of what's wrong, but also a sense about how to make it happen, right? How to, to make things change. And so I think clearly articulating that and what you bring um, in terms of understanding of, the, of the, the area that you're working in, the issues that you're working on, and your, your brilliant ideas is really important to just keep, make that clear. Um, and I think that's what makes for, um, you know, compelling resource mobilization. I, I totally agree. And, and, and the only thing that I would add, um, you know, as Jessica said, in, in doing the work, um, you know, of your community, I think it doesn't matter whether it's a small population or a large one. I think when you are, um, uh, and so often what happens is that we sort of, you know, really drive the work. We work very hard. Um, and, and oftentimes we don't come up to look around and see who else is doing exactly what we're doing. Maybe not in your community, but a community close by or within the country, you might find some very um, helpful allies that are really doing the same kind of work that you're doing. And I would really encourage um, uh, you know, being able to leverage those opportunities and to build coalitions among each other, um, not just for the funding potential um, that comes with that, you know, being able to share and leverage dollars that you're, you're uh, both are all getting from different funders, but also this sort of um, care that comes from being able to lean into a network of people who are like-minded, who are trying to address the same issues. It could be backbreaking sometimes and often sometimes very depressing to do some of the work that we do for social justice. So I really encourage um, lifting up a little bit, asking around who is doing what you're doing, maybe in other places close to you um, so that you guys can come together. And I think Jessica was mentioning this in the last section, but you can also strategize together. You can also sort of exchange ideas and um, and resources that are not just money, um, it, you know, it could be back in and things, um, grant writing and, and other uh, resources that you might need. Um, but I do think being a part of these coalitions is what makes up a movement. And so the ability to be able to do that, I think, is really, really important, both for you personally as a leader, but also for the organization and your stakeholders. Thank you both. We have eight minutes left and I'm going to try really quickly to fit in one more question here that I think is steering us towards. So what next? Um, are there any funders who did this particularly well now, I suppose, aside from Global Fund for Women, who are helping to set the pace and provide a model for other donors who may want to do better at this but aren't quite sure how to start? And Latanya, I see you're still well, unmuted. So let's start with you. Yeah, and I'll be really quick because I maybe Jessica has a, a longer list. Mine is quite short. Um, but I, I would say the Global Fund for Women actually belongs to a network, and Jessica mentioned this earlier, um, of you know, an international network called Prospera. So there are, you know, Mama Cash and Global Fund for Women and others are are, are global. And so we work across six regions, but there are very, uh, uh, there are regional funds in Africa, um, Latin America, Asia, um, and then there are national funds. Um, and you were seeing more and more national funds. I think you're also seeing, um, in addition to the traditional women's funds, you're starting to see that even some of the larger NGOs, like right now Oxfam has a feminist fund um, that they'll be using to sort of mirror the things that Jessica and I are talking about, this term unrestricted core support for women's organizations in the countries where they function. And so I think you'll see that growing uh, with a number of the larger NGOs who understand the need to really have very dedicated um, uh, funding for, for this kind of work. And I would also just say from the, the larger philanthropic side that I also see that there's a shift happening. And so you're starting to see that even um, some of the larger um, 
uh, you know, uh, tip, you know, like the Gates Foundation and others are starting to actually see where there is some value in this accountability to women and gender equality and are starting to see that the voices um, of, of these organizations are going to be hugely important in advocacy at the highest level. And so those are just my, my thoughts that we're moving in the right direction. We can't let up, we gotta keep pushing and that, that's what feminist funds do. Um, and we'll keep pushing the others to get closer to, to who we are and our values while we all try to address and leverage the work that we do. But over to you, Jessica, maybe you have some ideas. I know we don't have a lot of time. So to just say also, um, within some of these communities, there's interesting um, sort of substream. So there's a whole movement around participatory grant making. The Central American Women's Fund is really a pioneer in developing these models where it's the applicants um, who decide on the, on the allocation of money. Um, and um, so Free to the Young Feminist Fund, Ohai, the East African LGBT um, and Sex Worker Rights Fund, um, and a number of other funds were actually kind of modeled on that Central American Women's Fund model and that idea of participation. Um, and that's a, a growing movement. If you look at hashtag shift the power in philanthropy, um, you'll kind of see a lot of community foundations and others who are part of that whole conversation, um, including thinking about more participatory and collaborative models of grant making. Um, and then again, I think it's interesting to just see, yeah, some of the large philanthropic organizations, Ford Foundation is, you know, um, really quite good about funding indirect costs, core um, through the build um, funding, looking at long-term resourcing um, for flexible resourcing for organizations. Um, there's, there's a lot of spaces in, in, in philanthropy that really are looking at these models and looking how to do it, um, how to do it better. So, and, and of course the trust-based philanthropy, lastly, um, which is now epitomized by Mackenzie Scott, but which is just this idea of, you know, investing in the mission, um, but then trusting organizations on the process um, and having, you know, a slightly less um, interventionist approach when it comes to um, monitoring the process of how people are engaging with the funds. Well, we have four minutes left. I wish we'd extended this. Um, and I'm kind of regretting now not asking for more of your time, but hopefully there'll be many, many more conversations in the future. Thank you both so much. And to close us out, um, let's do a very quick, can we have from both of you a one minute elevator pitch for why feminist philanthropy needs to be the next step in global health funding? Let's start with Latanya and then Jessica, you can take us out and wrap up the night as well. Yeah, and I'll be very, very quick because I know it's all been said during this session and I really appreciate the time, um, but, but you know, it is, funding bold, ambitious, and expansive um, movements, social justice and gender justice movements, um, it's what's going to create the change that we, we really hope for in our lifetimes and beyond. Um, and so we, we strongly believe that funding feminist organizations and movements, um, you know, from the ground up and not the top down, and being responsive to movements um, is what we have to focus on in the days that we're living in. Um, you know, feminists around the globe have been organizing around gender justice for so many years. This is not new. Um, yet they're doing this without the benefit of connection and solidarity, and they're doing it on these shoestring budgets. I, I, you know, I'm grateful to be a part of panels like this because it does present the opportunity to collaborate and ask what could be unlocked if organizers could more easily share their learnings, resources, and information with each other and access better resources to sustain this work. And so we are going to continue to do, uh, you know, and support more flexible spending for, for organizers, um, for activists, um, for movements. And um, we're going to do this in the midst of our, our, the crisis. And, um, and, and I'll leave it there uh, because leadership is going to be so important for us as we continue to move forward with multi-year and general operating support to drive change. Thank you. And to just kind of echo back in a black tradition, because it's true um, that, you know, this activism is going to lead the change because it has led the change. And, you know, we have a lot of evidence from history that shows that actually active women's involvement in progressive movements, as well as feminist activism, 
is actually central to shifting up, to winning when it comes to democratic wins, right? To actually winning when it comes to making changes that are to the benefit of all of society. So we know that from the past and we don't want to forget it in the present so that we can make sure that we keep building towards equitable futures. Um, And just to close out by thinking that because this is, you know, um, a space that is looking at the intersection between gender and health, I think one of the things, you know, to remember is that ecosystemic approaches are essential, right? They're essential if we're going to really see effective change. Um, And one of the gifts of public health is actually this capacity to understand the interconnections, right? For public health, it's between the biological, the political, the social. Um, And so we need to really carry this vision of being able to think in ecosystemic ways into how we fund as well, right? To ensure that we are resourcing the full ecosystem of transformation, and that includes feminist activism. So when we're working on global health questions, we are including the feminist activism that is actually essential to solving for them, right? And we're funding into the full ecosystem. And we have, again, a lot of evidence um, that shows how effective that is. Um, And that actually when you build on the contributions um, of innovation in feminist civil society around both the ethics and the programming approaches, you end up with models like evidence-based prevention models that we're now seeing are actually managing to reduce um, prevalence in one of the most intractable or seemingly intractable questions, which is violence against women, right? Um, So... Again, critical to think ecosystemically, um, to therefore make sure that we're funding the full picture and also to make sure that we are learning with and learning from um, and not just seeing feminist organizing and civil society organizations as implementing partners, rather their thought partners, their visionary partners and crucial to include, you know, as we're looking for solutions for some of these, you know, global health questions. Um, And I know that we are almost at time. And so I just wanted to sort of do a quick summary um, of the conversation. It's been brilliant. Again, this Lancet Commission on Gender and Global Health um, is so valuable because it brings together such an interdisciplinary mix. And I feel like this conversation has highlighted a number of crucial things. One is that, you know, women's community organizing um, is really around philanthropy, is kind of the root model um, of feminist philanthropy. And so we, we honor the roots and respect the roots Um, and think about what those models um, of women organizing in community to resource justice and to resource transformation can tell us about what we need to do for the future. It's clear that we need to move out of siloed based funding um, because it doesn't map onto people's realities. And Latanya talked about the need for intersectional approaches because those actually deal with the full picture um, you know, and rather than dealing with pieces of it, which means that we never again get to actually um, reach full solutions. Thinking about intersectional in approach, but then interdisciplinary, right, in, in terms of how we're doing the work itself. To when we're, we're funding into this work to support core, long term, flexible, to ensure that we consider that backlash is always present. And so make sure that, that again, our funding lasts long enough to be able to make sure that the wins are sustained over time. Um, and to consider that, you know, we can look into, um, into work that already exists to see um, kernels of innovation that we can actually think about working with to scale. Um, and lastly, to acknowledge that expertise um, and knowledge exists everywhere and to really make sure that, again, as we're thinking about, you know, these processes of knowledge production, of design, um, of imagining what next Um, that we are acknowledging that expertise resides everywhere. So we're making sure that we're listening to um, the work that's happening in community organizing and feminist civil society mobilization as a domain of expertise um, and not just of just of of practice, as it were. So that's the summary. Um, And just to thank everybody for coming and also to just remind you that Um, The next conversation is happening uh, with Simon Dennis, and it's around looking at gender violence in health institutions. So it's going to be the 25th of May. Um, The time is up on the slide um, and we hope that people are able to attend. So thank you very much.